Eddie Ruza, and what will be some busy months ahead for Congress? Eddie. Phil, Congress reconvenes next Tuesday after a five-week recess, and there are some weighty and urgent matters they have to attend to. A vote on the Iran nuclear agreement, an October 1st deadline to fund the government amid threats of another federal shutdown if Planned Parenthood is part of the legislation, resurrecting a massive and perhaps permanent transportation bill that has been temporarily extended 34 times since 2009, and yet another debt ceiling fiscal cliff. Well, joining us tonight to share their thoughts on these and hopefully other issues are Congressman Bill Foster, a Democrat representing Illinois' 11th district, which includes Aurora, Naperville, and Joliet, among other areas. And Congressman Peter Roskam, a Republican representing Illinois' 6th district, which includes Barrington, West Chicago, and Downers Grove, as well as other communities. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Uh, Peter Roskam, let me begin with you, because you have been one of the vocal opponents of the Iran nuclear deal. You serve on the House Republican Israel Caucus. You're the co-chair, actually, of that. Is this all about the security of Israel? No, but the security of Israel is of great interest to the United States. It's about the security of the United States. So I'm against the deal because I think, first and foremost, it gives the imprimatur of approval of a nuclear ambition for Iran that is peaceful. Up until now, we have said that Iran has no right to a nuclear ambition, and the administration has shifted from a policy of containment, essentially, or, you know, they've, they've shifted policies without articulating it. It gives $150 billion to the Iranians, and um, it gives them open field running in terms of their capacity to move forward and sponsor uh, terrorist activities around the world. So those are the reasons that I'm against it. Also, it puts Israel at great risk. Bill Foster, uh, have you decided how you will vote on this? No, I have not. Um, you know, as the last physicist in Congress, in fact, the last PhD scientist of any kind, I've uh, spent a lot of time doing due diligence on it. I think I'm up to my 14th uh, briefing on this, many of them individual classified briefings by the experts, uh, the nuclear experts who supported the negotiating team. And in fact, there's a connection to Argonne uh, in yes. involved in this. Tell us about that. Yes, well, um, under the agreement, if it goes forward, Iraq will tear apart the Iran. Iran, I'm sorry, will we'll tear apart the guts of its Arak reactor, A-R-A-K reactor. Um, and this is a reactor that had been capable and will be if they proceed with it uh, to produce a large amount of weapons grade plutonium. It's going to be completely redesigned and that design was done largely at Argonne National Lab which is doing a lot of support for the negotiating team. Well just to follow up on your decision, you have told uh, another interviewer recently, I believe yesterday or the day before, that you are leaning towards voting for it. What is stopping you uh, no, in your decision? No, I have not said that. I think that was an interpretation um, by someone who listened to the interview. Um, no, this is a, a very complex thing. There, there's a two-step uh, two process from my point of view. The first one is to look at the technical details of this. Uh, the, de the agreement's over 100 pages long, and it's probably 40 percent of it detailed technical specifications and so on. And so I'm looking really hard at those because obviously it does no one any good if we approve a deal and then we find there's a big technical flaw that Iran drives a truck through. And so, but then there's a second step in this, which is you have to ask yourself, all members of Congress, um, what happens, what does the world look like the day after we vote this down or we vote to let it and what does it look like 15 years after that? And so this is the tough psychological and diplomatic calculation that every member of Congress has to make. Peter Roskam, as I'm sure you're very well aware, this is an issue that has divided the American Jewish community. There are those that are very much for it and say that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel has been a, a warmonger in, in this process. There are those who uh, feel very much like you do that uh, Israel's uh, security and protection is, is first and foremost. You recently met with Benjamin Netanyahu Netanyahu on a trip to Israel. Can you tell us about that? I can. Um, what was interesting, in addition to the meeting with the Prime Minister, and I was able to spend 30 minutes with him just one-on-one, -on -one, but what was interesting was the other meetings that I had with the Israeli leadership, but I didn't hear any elected voice in Israel, and we met with leaders in the opposition. No one was in favor of this deal, and in fact, they said, look, we have differences with the Netanyahu team on this, that, and the other thing, which is typical domestic politics, but on Iran, every single 
elected leader that we were with said that they were opposed to the deal. What's interesting too is the nature of the approach when, when John Kerry came in and gave us a briefing, um, I'm sure Congressman Foster was there as well as me and 350 other members of the House. He said an interesting thing that got my attention. At the end of his discussion he said, folks, what's the alternative? And that's a provocative question. And I asked him in a follow-up, you know, for two years the administration has been telling us that no deal is better than a bad deal. And if that's true, that means that there was an alternative. Three times. Have you seen an alternative as you've read this document? Well, look, the alternative is to reassert American leadership as it relates to the sanctions. It was the sanctions that brought the Iranians to the table in the first place and to reconstruct that and not give them this ability to get $150 billion to continue to fund Hezbollah and Hamas. Bill Foster, do you agree? What? Well, when uh, Senator Kerry described how he walked away from the negotiations multiple times, he did not walk away alone. He walked away with the consent and the consensus of the other, the P3 plus 3 um, partners in that were necessary to get international sanctions. If we walk away at this point, we walk away alone. The U.S. is isolated. The sanctions are going to be very difficult to reconstruct. And that is the, the difficult calculation that every member of Congress is weighing here. In terms of the votes, you don't believe that the votes are there, in, at least in the House, to approve it? Is that what I you're believe going? a majority of the House and the majority of the Senate are opposed to this deal. I think a majority of the Israeli leadership unanimously, in fact, are against it. And I think a majority of the public is against it. So um, how we go in terms of overriding a presidential veto, I, I, you don't I, know about that, those votes. I right recognize now. that that's a very tall order. All right, let's, let's turn to the, the funding issues which are coming up. The October 1st deadline for government funding. Uh, there are some that are pinning it to whether Planned Parenthood is funded underneath, uh, in that bill or not. Do you uh, back that? Look, I think those Planned Parenthood videos are a scandal. And I think anybody that looks at them, regardless of their position on abortion, says the federal government, the United States taxpayer, ought not be funding that operation. And I've had any number of discussions across the scale that have said folks are not interested in, in being complicit with an organization that is clearly trafficking in, in baby parts, for goodness sake. So, uh, but, but, Congressman, there have been uh, more than a few reports that say these videos have been heavily doctored to present this point of view that they are, as in your words, trafficking in baby parts. They haven't been reports. They've been assertions by Planned Parenthood, who's not willing to deal with the underlying, the underlying claims that have been made. They've just been said, well, they're illegal and we're not doing it. But it's clear that they have been legally made, and I think it's clear that they're complicit in it. But you're for defunding uh, Planned Parenthood or not including that in the, in the plan? Does yes. it, pin, does it your, your vote uh, depend on that? Well, look, there's going to be a number of going to go into the decision as it relates to activities to defund Planned Parenthood, but I would vote absolutely to defund Planned Parenthood. Uh, Bill Foster, uh, one of the issues that, that also came up this summer was in terms of, of uh, the, the transportation bill, which we're going to get to in a second, was this import-export bank. And uh, Senator Ted Cruz has now infamously uh, is being remembered for calling Mitch McConnell a liar. But in terms of, again, this, this funding bill for the for the federal government. Is there a possibility of another government shutdown? Um, yeah, I'm afraid there is. I mean, when you see a, a significant number of Republicans saying they will, they will not vote uh, to keep the government uh, lights on and the doors open unless Planned Parenthood is defunded, I think that's a recipe for disaster. I'm very worried that we're heading for another government shutdown over an issue that really should be separate um, in my mind from this. I'm, I'm pro-choice. I don't back down from that. Uh, but I think that any discussion here should be separated from the necessary business of running the government. And I was very disappointed with the history of the appropriations um, here. Uh, for months, Democrats and Republicans worked together in a bipartisan way to put together appropriation bills um, and where every member got to put their amendments in. And, and there were a lot of votes we took. And then in the end, uh, just before the break, uh, we learned that, well, maybe we'll get a continuing resolution, and we're just going to do what we did last year. Um, and so Are you talking really about the transportation bill at this No, I'm point. talking about all appropriations bills. They were shut down, um, shut down a month or two ago, and it was a big disappointment because it shut down all bipartisan effort on appropriations. Is anything going to get done in the coming weeks in terms of the so. debt ceiling, in terms of the budget, in terms of this transportation well, bill? Let's go right to the transportation issue because I think that there's a real opportunity. Most folks recognize that the transportation fund, the highway fund, needs more money. So the question is, how how do you get that? Right now, there's a very serious 
effort that's underway that is says, look, we've got two trillion that are locked out of the United States because of a tax policy that locks out worldwide American companies and their profits overseas. Let's lower that tax rate. It's called repatriation when it comes home. That's new money. It's found money. A lot of ghost signals on this that they're interested in it. We could lower that rate, repatriate the money. The money that then comes in is then dedicated strictly to transportation, and I think it's a winning combination. Will you vote to raise the debt ceiling? Look, you've got to always look at the debt ceiling discussion in the context of other changes that have been made, other savings. So I think the only thing uh, that you want to avoid is simply just saying we're just going to raise it willy-nilly no matter what. We've got a $17 trillion debt obligation, and the, we don't want the state, of, the state of Illinois to be the example uh, for the federal government. The state is an example of what not to do based on bad leadership and avoidance behavior. We can't do that anymore. Congressman Foster, well, would you vote for people the debt ceiling? Re people remember what happened the last time we had a default crisis in this country. The stock market lost $3 trillion of value. The, the United States got its credit rating downgraded for the first time in human memory. And so I'm very worried that we're going to head back into this simply because so many members um, on my colleague's side of the aisle um, are, are, you know, have basically run on a platform of, of pledging not to raise the debt ceiling and not paying the, the bills that the United States has incurred. Since you brought up the issue of Illinois and the current standoff, and as you call it, bad management. What are your thoughts on what's happening here in the state? And is a federal bailout even a, a possibility? The federal bailout is not a possibility. So Illinois has got to figure out Illinois' situation. And I am a strong supporter of Governor Rauner. I think he's gone down there and he's trying to take this very difficult situation on. He's dealing with decades of bad practice and he's trying to correct this. And I think he's trying to lead the state in a very Way. What's interesting is for the first time in a long time, people know who Michael J. Madigan is, the Speaker of the House, and now these two people, as it's been described, are staring one another down, and I'm rooting for the governor. Who yeah. are you rooting for in this? Well, I think the, the governor has misdiagnosed the problems with Illinois. Uh, Illinois' biggest single problem is that every year between 20 and $40 billion leaves the state because we pay a lot more in federal taxes than we get back in federal spending. The average citizen of Illinois pays about $1,500 more every single year in federal taxes than the average person in the United States, and the federal spending returning to Illinois is less than the federal average by about $1,800. So I've joined with my Republican colleague Scott Garrett of New Jersey in forming the Payer States Caucus and we're starting to take action because we fundamentally don't believe the federal government should be in the, process, in the, in the business of transferring huge amounts of wealth from one state to another. All right, let's end with uh, the, the presidential campaign and your thoughts on what's going on because there have been, at least on the Republican side, some, uh, some very uh, different and, and at times entertaining and at time, sometimes, I'm sure, for the Repub Republican Party, distressing moments. Donald Trump is the, is the front runner. What do you think of that? Well, it's interesting. It's supposed to be miserable to become the nominee of a major party, and it is. So you've got, uh, you've got 15 people on the Republican side. You've got an heir apparent, uh, Hillary Clinton, who thought it was going to be open field running, and it's not for her. So let's see who ends up being the nominees of both of these parties. And I think I was on Polish television, and they were asking me about this. And I said, what Americans expect is their, their leadership to go through an arduous process to become the nominee, an arduous general election, and then, then you've got to take on Vladimir Putin, the mullahs, and ISIS. Do you think Trump is going to be the Republican nominee? No. Who will be? Your guess is as good as mine. Who are you supporting? I haven't declared. It's all preseason talk. I want to who of these people has the capacity to go out, campaign aggressively, put forth a positive vision for the country, but your guess is as good as mine. Congressman Foster, what are your thoughts on both the Republican and the Democratic uh, side? Well, I endorse Hillary Clinton. She's going to make a, a great president. And I've is really going to be been, up against Donald I've been Trump? Impressed. I've been impressed at the difference in the nature of the debate taking place on the Democratic and the Republican side. On the Democratic side, we're having thoughtful debate about the real problems. And Bernie Sanders is bringing up real issues that, that Americans of all political stripes But he's stripes not getting as much coverage up. as Donald Trump? What do you think about that? 
Well, I think that's a feature of the Republican um, primary. Well, one other point's important here, and that is the Democrats are unwilling to debate. And Gong Governor O'Malley has been very critical of his party, saying Hillary Clinton won't go on a stage. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the chairman of the DNC, doesn't know what to do with it. But to say that there's a thoughtful debate on the Democratic side, in my view, is an overstatement. All right. Bill, uh, Peter Ruskin and Bill Foster, thank you very much.